Hello and welcome back to Watchmen Talk, a series of conversations with Israeli military and security experts and practitioners. This is part two of our conversation with Major General Retired Mickey Edelstein. Welcome. Good afternoon, Amir. Thank you. I'm Amir Oren. And um, troop command in battle is obviously uh, one of the most highly valued stops or steps in uh, an officer's career. And uh, you uh, apparently accumulated a lot of combatants from uh, the uh, team or squad level up all the way to brigade in Lebanon in 2006 and then division in Gaza in 2004. 14, yeah. 14. Were there any uh, lessons which were different um, as you went up in the ranks? Um, a small unit leader probably thinks, see things in a different light tactically, and then as a general officer, a brigadier general in charge of a division um, working in another atmosphere, or as you call it, an ecosystem, with the uh, commanding general of the front and the general staff and perhaps the cabinet. Uh, tell us about it. My career made me to face as a commander, I think all the mid and the large operational events that the IDF faced in the last, in the past 20 years or so, uh, even more, 25 years. Uh, this, uh, I basically, I quote what uh, General Kochavi told me when he, uh, we, uh, I ended my uh, military career. Uh, I said, you're the only general here around the table that really faced everything. Which, which brings um, the question, why did he let you go? But it's this okay. is for another talk. Uh, so if you ask me about the, uh, my lesson learned, I would say that uh, the real changing uh, was between 2006 and 2014. And uh, actually, 2012. I tell you why. Because my second day in uh, in Gaza uh, division was a pillar of defense. Uh, this was my second day, and then my last two months were uh, Tsukaitan. Pillar of defense was an operation where only air and artillery fire was employed. Uh, no infantry or armor units entered Gaza. Right, but. Uh, we did have to train uh, three brigades that time that was under my command, the side of the, let's say, uh, uh, aerial, uh, other uh, aerial stuff and so forth. Uh, what I understood is the, the fact that uh, as a brigade commander and higher than this, your mission is to f basically to uh, design the right conditions, uh, the needed conditions to the brigades and the battalions and so forth, that they be able to execute the best they can their missions. This is before the uh, action starts, but once it is in operation, you have no control over what happens? There is something very that I took uh, from the American and the British languages about commanders. The way they, the way uh, they call the different levels. They say the uh, company and platoon leader. Later on, they say battalion and brigade commander, and then you have the general. And it highly uh, emphasize or make you the better understanding what it's all about commanding in the different levels. Leading versus commanding. Versus commanding and versus general. generalship. Means that if I go as a company or platoon uh, leader, you're on the first line, you're the first uh, uh, between your troops. You lead them within the fighting. When you come to be, become a, a, a battalion a commander, you are just in between the leadership and commanding different efforts. Field grade uh, echelon. Uh, right. And in brigade, you cannot be everywhere. You never be able to see your all four or five uh, battalions fighting. Uh, up to a company level, you are in command of the soldiers. Right. Higher than that, you are in command only of the officers leading them. Right. As a general, 
you influence the day after. And you don't, the, you don't influence what happens now. And if you try to influence what happens now, it's only very, very rare occasions. I had once back in Gaza, but it was not on a, the way the battalion fought or a, uh, the, a brigade fought. It was a, a, the time that uh, basically a terrorist went out from one of the tunnels and we ordered the Air Force to attack them. Uh, within Israel's territory? Within Israel territory. They decided, hey, they are not sure because they were, they looked like uh, IDF soldiers. They, they but, were in uniform. Right, in but we, we saw what we, and we understood and we knew where our forces are and so forth. And then I had to go and to intervene and to order through the communication. It's, it's still been record, uh, it's, it's, the record is still exists. And I ordered them, this is the division commander talking, are you, you're going to execute your missiles now. The pilots. The pilots. And, and this is while you well remember what happened 14 years earlier in this Duvdevan in Asira Shamalia right. operation, right, exactly. friendly fire. Right. So what, did you also have that uh, in, in my the back mind, of your mind? Definitely, definitely. I think, uh, you know, since we are dealing with lives of our people, uh, most cherished people, in the, and we are responsible for them, I think the way you always have a layer on top of the other layers, and you have to remember them all throughout your career. And not to, to, let's say, follow wrong paradigms, but to understand what you should you take and what should you not take out of it. Uh, but I never influ I never intervened within a fighting of a platoon or a brigade uh, while they were uh, dealing. I, for example, in 2014, every 48 hours, I visited every uh, brigade commander, uh, commander, uh, let's say the post, and I did a learning process with them to understand are they fighting well. Uh, maybe I didn't order right, or maybe they did uh, different mistakes, but no. never within on what we call on a live uh, event. This is a protective edge um, operation, but. Eight years earlier, you were in charge of the Nahal Infantry Brigade, right. and you had mostly your organic battalions, plus armor and uh, engineering and mm -hmm. other forces. But in Gaza, you had uh, something else. You had uh, battalion combat teams and brigade combat teams where you have different battalions from, from different branches. What is the better formation? In Gaza, I had, overall, I had seven brigades under my command uh, most times, in, in the same times. Uh, I will give you the, the answer through a story of one of our reserve battalions that I was given. It was part of uh, the armor brigade, Abamo Chishim. The, uh, the armor school. School, right. And they were given a reserve battalion and uh, to fought with them to fight with them the day after. I went to see the, what the scores were. I, I called my friends Ron and Numa. I told him, how do you evaluate them? Because he was, he was in charge of the National Training Center. He told me, look, they have huge gaps to fight. I told him what it's all about. He said, the last time that they did a night exercise was a couple of years ago, and so forth. And I came to this brigade commander and asked him to see his plans. And his plans were to put this battalion and to start fighting with them in 1 a.m., okay, at night. So this is a regular brigade which has a complementary reserve, reserve battalion. Reserve battalion, right. Of reservists, of people, people uh, that, that with civilian came, occupations. 48 hours before, they were still civilians. I told him, why are you doing it? I, and uh, he told me, look, it's the best way to surprise the enemy. I told him, look, we have to make to management the risks. Uh, the risk of fighting the enemies at night versus the day are better than uh, what that we might have a friendly fire. Because the area is that complicated, it's so complicated, and they are not 
they are not a, in the right, let's say, uh, they, they don't have the needed capacity to start their fighting at night. So you have to know yourself, your forces, no less than you have to know the enemy. Exactly. And this was one of my lessons learned from Duvdevan, to understand the capacity of your forces. And I told them, look, how many terrorists did you think that you might uh, uh, face this battalion? Tell me 30, okay. What do you think will be the, the results if you're standing here? It's 8 a.m. in the morning. You say, I'm going to crush them. Okay, then you better start it, not at 8 a.m., you'll define whatever you want, but let this battalion to have a successful first fight. This and is, a, thought, this I, is I, an I, American lesson. Um, win the first fight. Right, definitely. Uh, so uh, I, ca I came to visit this battalion the night, the evening after, after the first fight. They went in daylight. I told him, look, if you, you, you don't agree with me, do whatever you want. You're the commander. Of course, it changed the, 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 the plans. They went in daytime, they killed terrorists and so forth. I came the evening to visit this battalion I, I, I will say that they thanked me, okay? And Did they have casualties? Not there, only some, uh, someone with some back problems, you know, reservists sometimes. <laughs> but you were not able to stop them the next five days. Next, this is the only battalion that fought throughout the fighting. So the initial success, which was achieved under better conditions than what their supervisor uh, right intended, made them perform even better later so, on. So uh, first for successful fight gave them the right confidence for themselves, for the brigade commander. And since the, the night after, they never stopped, whether it was night, day, urban area, no matter what. So you were a senior officer, a brigadier general, but there were two echelons above you, the major general, Sami Turjuman, in charge of the front, and the uh, chief of staff, uh, who happens now to be the defense minister, uh, Benny Gantz, as his commanding officer. And then again, you had the cabinet, the political echelon mm -hmm. above them. How much freedom of maneuver did you have as a division commander? I think uh, I met several times, even the cabinet member, even the from VC with the, even the, with the prime minister, and many times, uh, General Guns as the chief of staff. Uh, and uh, the Minister of Defense at that time, uh, Bogi Alon, uh, former chief of staff. Does uh, it matter? Does it matter that, that these people um, have military experience, people in the cabinet? It helps if they understand the role of their uh, uh, position in that this time. They cannot tell you how to maneuver now. They should uh, focus, and I think they were positively, very high focused, uh, Minister Yalon, on the purpose of this war, and not the way you execute it down on the But even more than level. that, um, General Yalon retired from uh, active military service nine years earlier. Uh, maybe his experience was no, more, uh, no longer relevant. Uh, if he tried to project himself into your considerations. So uh, I share with you that, uh, not surprisingly, uh, that time Minister Yalon visited us a couple times before when we were able to discover some of the terror tunnels into Israel. And then we start this, the, discussioning, uh, the discussion about what the purpose of the war should be, should we have one. So we have a kind of a basic understanding about the purposes. It did change somehow a couple months before, and it's good because it was by or through a very deep discussion with General Gantz, and he is the one that should represent those issues to the cabinet. Uh, and I think it was, uh, so, it was done very well in, uh, from his perspective. So the levels above you basically decide the what, the levels under you decide the how, and you, some of, a mix of both? A, a, a brigadier general, uh, let's say a division commander, is just in between the strategic level 
and the operation one and somehow the tactic ones. Uh, a command, a command commander like Sami Turgeman is not on the tactical level. He should not be. He should highly be focused. Are we executing or are we following the right the purposes of the war? The major general above you and two other divisions who were supposed right, to be there. Right, right. Uh, and I have, I have to uh, write down the missions that they are following the right purposes and uh, we should not, and it's, you know the war, you know, I mean, you know very well Gaza. So if you penetrate too much, sometimes you, you can miss one of the purposes or so because it was such a dense place with civilians and so forth. And you have to extricate yourself right. uh, in, in order to go back. Now, Mickey Edelstein, um, we still have uh, only some 10 minutes to go and we have two major topics to cover. One is your... Um, ideas regarding the reorganization of special forces, and the other is your American experience working vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, the Central Command, the European Command, Special Operations uh, Command. So let's start with uh, special forces. Um, in Israel, there are three strong or two and a half strong uh, arms, intelligence, Air Force, Navy. Each has its own uh, special unit. Sayat Batkal, Shaldag, and Shayat Shloshasr, Flotilla 13. There are also other units, such as Duvdevan. Now there is a commando brigade, which was partly um, because of your uh, work. How can Israel better organize, better exploit its special forces so that they have, if not unity of command, unity of training, of equipment, um, in order not to have three separate battalions or brigades, but one effective force. We have to remember that uh, there are pretty huge differences between uh, Seat Matkal, Flotilla 13, and Shaldag versus the other units. Uh, even in some of the basic capabilities uh, capabilities or uh, capacities that we want to give or to have within uh, each of the warriors, they have to be trained a bit different. Uh, for example, as we talked uh, earlier, uh, the other commander units usually don't face the question whether or not to abort a mission. In general, maybe some of the special uh, uh, very unique capabilities within Duvdevan. They think about uh, the one that acts like Arabs. Uh, so basically, some of the trainings are very, very, in, in general, uh, different. Uh, and you, you build this ecosystem from the first day. And this is the reason that we cannot have one school for everyone. But, for example, for the commando division, which uh, consists uh, Duvdevan, Egoz, and Maglan, we do have basically one school now. This is a brigade. A brigade. Uh, the commando brigade. Yes. And, and about equipment, the basic equipment, by the way, is the same. I, uh, uh, when I was uh, in charge of the infantry and special forces chief of staff in the army headquarters, I remember uh, my, my meetings with Seret Matkal, and I gave them the, whatever they needed as a team in Egoz, Duvdevan, Shaldag, and others. Uh, maybe they, you know, Flotilla 13 has something different because of sea needs. But but their chain of command is separate. Is Yes, but not about the training, the basic training equipment. At that time, they were given by me. Usually, they gave their own budget, but they asked to, to buy through us in order to have the... Well, the right. budget authority is a very important asset. Yes, yes. Then they, uh, then they, they all come over the to world, you. All over the world. Uh, so there are things that they can highly uh, share uh, together, but not everything. And I think we come in a, in, a, in general to the right, uh, the, the break even point the way it should be. Uh, establishing the commando brigade gave a huge strength uh, for the IDF that he is able to execute an operation in wartime or as needed of a commando brigade or 
we still uh, have the, the needed independence for each of the unit to act by itself, and even up to the teams. So you definitely, we might happen in the next war that uh, the commando brigade will consist the three, almost the three units, but part of their groups will act, will act uh, independently. Uh, so this is the, the way we understand that it, we should have it. So, so you are satisfied with what has happened over the last decade or so um, since you, you uh, were probably um, the officer most pushing for this reorganization? Uh, yes, I think uh, I, I talked uh, a year ago with uh, now he is the ex uh, commander uh, brigade uh, commander, uh, and he is highly satisfied of this situation. Uh, they did an evaluation with the former army chief of staff about this uh, concept, whether it works or not. Uh, and definitely, we see more strength than weaknesses we faced before because we almost didn't touch the units themselves. We, on top of the units, we put a brigade a command. The superstructure. In, right. Now, regarding the United States, um, and you are um, held in high esteem by your American colleagues uh, when they visit Israel or when they uh, meet with other Israelis, they always uh, speak very highly of you. Obviously, you left quite an impression as the representative of the IDF. Um, how did you uh, strike this friendship and camaraderie with your American colleagues? Um, first, I was uh, lucky to have a very professional, uh, I was lucky to have a very professional and uh, uh, intellectual commanders within the, the U.S. forces. I think it's not a, a one time. They are, their generals are very, very professional, very well educated. Uh, and the way to establish such a friendship and trust, which is the most important thing, is to have everything on the table throughout the time. And mostly to discuss the disagreements uh, and I remember once that uh, we faced one of the challenges uh, in the time that General Isaacot was a commander. And uh, they asked to know something and we told him, look, such thing, we keep it very, very close to our hearts. Whenever you need, you'll be aware of it. But we cannot share everything. Uh, and I'm happy to say that a couple of months after, my successor was able to execute it. And at uh, that time... Uh, the Senator Command uh, sent me a text. He said, I remember you promised me, and you execute your promise, although you're not here. Isn't it obvious that you have to be obvious? It seems like uh, a very uh, uh, simple uh, lesson. Uh, why, why is it that uh, some people think they, they have uh, to keep it secret from the other friendly uh, service? Because there are tensions, there are some uh, mutual interests, some let's say, interests that are not uh, fit, that do not fit your side and, and so forth. And, so, and uh, remember that we as a generals are acting under a political leadership that sometimes see eye to eye things and sometimes not. But we have to keep the trust. Uh, I think uh, that one of the, my lesson learned was to see things through the American eyes and then to have a better way to explain things and to explain disagreements. So you were the U.S. military's ambassador to the IDF and not only the other way around. Right. Uh, and uh, I think it also, uh, General Isaac Ote is a great part of such a thing. He basically was the first one to write down that the relationship first and most with the United States and uh, later on in general, uh, all the different, let's say, other uh, uh, militaries are an important assets for the IDF to fulfill his mission. Although we want to defend ourselves by ourselves, but to understand today the complexity that we are facing and the fact that uh, some of the militaries that time used to fought in uh, Syria in a very, let's say, was a very uh, intensive 
water. Against the Daesh and the Iranians. Against the Daesh and the Iranians and uh, Russia. And having those, those tension, how to uh, have a better understanding, a better... Uh, uh, and to find the mutual interest and the disagreement. In did you have about. did you have a chance to update your late father on that regarding the um, enhanced level of cooperation with the U.S. military? Uh, yes, he was. Uh, he followed very well up to his last day. <laughs> uh, he thought that it is very very important. He really supports. He obviously. Part of his, uh, let's say, he was a very, let's say, curious guy about many things. Uh, and uh, But he always told me what I told you, the first uh, part. Be able to pre- to defend yourself by yourself, always. Now, I think, we, it's, Amir, if I may, yes, this was one of the things that the American generals highly appreciated. And the one that uh, mentioned such this thing was uh, Secretary Mattis. They said, this is the reason that I like to do business with you. That we do not, that Israel does not rely on the U.S. to rescue it. Yes, right. And uh, I may, if I may, I even so, I read one of the media notes today about different things that uh, are being, uh, let's say, that some, some very high level within the American side said about Israel and slim money and so forth. It's not the way it's been... Uh, was very, very different between the generals and even the political level. Mickey Edelstein, Major General, uh, retired former IDF uh, defense attaché, chief uh, paratroop and uh, infantry officer, Gaza division chief, and many other positions. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time to speak with us. Thank you very much, Amir. Thank you, and we will be back with another conversation with another Israeli military and security expert very soon.